Um, we'll just start at the start then. Um, the first part is obviously making sure that you're you're logged into Glow um, to access these kind of tools. Um, and the ones that I'm, I'm, I can go between um, some um, Google and some Microsoft. I think for the purpose of it, we'll mostly be using the Microsoft apps, um, just because there's some some quite particular tools in there that are that are effective. But um, again, if you're watching that and you're in a Google local authority, or you're using Google in your school. Um, just ask in the comments and we can we can try and do a wee demonstration of the, the Google equivalent. And if again we switch to Google, there's a Microsoft equivalent. Um, so we'll be able to, to, to talk you through any of those that you're maybe missing. Um, but we do want to give those broad strokes. So, so just based on the feedback from people, we, we thought we'd look at some application for digital literacy skills in literacy in English. Um, what we're not going to do, um, and just to, to make sure we're clear, I'm not going to tell them how to teach literacy in English. Uh, I've not got, uh, I'm not going to tell you how you should be teaching writing or spelling or reading or anything else. Um, but what we wanted to look at is how you can get lessons that you've got already up your sleeve or in your head. Perhaps you had these lessons for the classroom and you're not sure how to get them from the classroom to your learners remotely. That's the part we really wanted to focus on. So it's that delivering hopefully again some some new ideas about how you might um broach digital learning remotely um and, and get those literacy and english lessons that you might have in the classroom out to your learners so um the first one i'm going to do then is in terms of making um learning accessible um so richard can you just double check for me is this my microsoft word screen that's being shared just now yep george can see that got that there so I've just got an example text here. Do um, excuse the lack of paragraphs. That's just the way it copied. Um, so you could be grabbing a text from anywhere at all. Um, and I've grabbed this from a World Book Day sample um, just to demonstrate this. Um, the first thing I want to make sure we, we do talk about it in every webinar, I think, in any training that you've done with our team, we'll have pointed it out to you. But um, if you are using Microsoft Word online through Glow, um, there is a version also on the desktop um, that you can download through Glow, but the, the online version is the one that I would use most often um, because it's handy um, and great for collaboration. But if I've got a text on the screen here and I go up to View and select Immersive Reader, Word will put a coloured background on. I can change that. So I can choose whichever colour suits, suits me best. Um, I can change the size of the text in this reading view and indeed the font. Um, and there are some other options here, um, including grammar and um, the presentation of it. You can go into three, one um, line focus and you can turn that off again. So that's the line focus options up here. Um, it might be useful for, for a reader who's maybe finding the screen rather busy and they can focus on one line at a time. So just in terms of making the reading um, accessible for learners immersive readers the first part we want to look at so i'd suggest any literacy in english task if you can get it into a word document um that's far better than perhaps you've got maybe a textbook page that you've photographed or scanned and sent that over to learners if it's on a word document they can use this immersive reader tool so that's an absolute um it's a win from the start once i'm in the immersive reader view i can just use this x arrow to go back in the top left and if I come back into it, the number one feature we really want to focus on is there's the background colours, of course, but this play button at the bottom of the screen. So I can use the voice settings just to make sure it's the right sort of speed. Um, so I can change the speed here and I can go between male and female voices. It's, it's currently only those two voices available um, through Word Online. Obviously, you can get other voices, including Scottish voices. Um, on your desktop version, but online it's just these two standard voices at the moment. When I hit that play button... Eric carefully lifted open the flap. Inside was a small piece of golden paper. It was an invitation. Eric held his breath and looked again at the front of the... So that's, that's an, as I say, an instant win. We've got this immersive reader tool and we can use that for our learners to be able to read um, unfamiliar texts um, or if they've got dyslexia or um, visual impairment or any, any other support needs that might make reading a wee bit more challenging, um, that, that tool's there to support um, all learners. That's free and it's built in. Now, another bit I think that's really useful about Immersive Reader, and I would use this with my own class, um, is when we're doing some vocabulary work. So if I go up to the, the options, there's three options in the top right here. 
if I go to grammar options, um, I can break words down into syllables. Um, that might be, I'm not going to say that's 100% accurate. That might just depend on who has decided which um, breaks go where in the letters. It's obviously an international um, piece of software, Microsoft Word. So it might um, be that you might not agree with some of the syllables there, but that could again be useful for learners understanding how to break down unfamiliar words there. Um, what you can see here is the purple words highlighted are adjectives and I can turn those options on and off. I can highlight my verbs and I can change the, the colour just to suit me reading it. So it can be whatever colour I, I need that to be. Um, but I think that's really useful if you're talking about word types with learners um, and perhaps you know from a, a younger age you're talking about whether it's nouns and verbs. Um, and you want them to be able to identify those in a text, they can use Immersive Reader to check which words these are. Again, the caveat, some words might be um, nouns, verbs, adjectives. It might depend on, on the use and the context of the word. And that's obviously where your, your teaching comes into that. But those tools are there um, and you can have multiple on at once. So you could be highlighting the, the difference between nouns and verbs there. Again, you can partner them up and you could look at nouns and adjectives together and you could see if there are any examples where, for example, here I've got a large boil. So what kind of boil was it? It was a large one and that's because the adjective and the noun are beside each other. So you could use it for that. Again, I've got a golden invitation. So if you're asking questions, if you're asking learners to interrogate, interrogate the texts, you know, what kind of invitation was it? Or why do you think that invitation was special? It was a golden invitation and the adjective there is doing that work to let us know that it was a special invitation. So I really like those tools um, for interrogating a text and I've also used those for writing. Um, I had a primary six class um, before joining the team and I made use of this. One of the best examples, um, one of the ones I thought was really effective was for a piece of writing where the learners were to write... Um, as a character study and we were talking about creating characters that came to life. Um, learners identified that they had to use more descriptive language such as adjectives and adverbs to describe the appearances and the movements of characters and we did that in the style of David um, Williams. Um, we'd, we'd done some um, learning around off -alante. So what my learners were able to do was when they were doing their writing about their characters they could simply slip into Immersive Reader, turn on adjectives and rather than having to come back and ask me regularly, have I got enough adjectives? Or completing a whole piece of writing for me to then have to feed back at the end that there were or there weren't enough adjectives. The learners were able to use um, Word to, to slip on this, this tool here and check the adjectives themselves. So they could have a look through and if you can see in this part of the page here, I've not got many adjectives. So I might want to have a look and see perhaps it's Lavernock's great birthday party. Um, he stood there quietly perhaps I might want to add in some adjectives and adverbs looking at this and seeing there's not as much description and again as I scroll through I can see I have got some there so I think that's really useful for self um, evaluation a wee bit of self assessment there learners can look at that and see if they do have um, enough examples so I also think conversely if you were writing a report and you wanted that factual plain English learners could do the writing um, put it into Immersive Reader, and if they do have lots of embellishment in there, they might want to remove that for, for example, a geography or a scientific report. The last part I want to show, just on Immersive Reader here, we've covered the speak, um, the speak tool, we've covered the highlight and the different text types here. The last one I've also got, the reading pre preferences here, and picture dictionary is automatically turned on. So if I pick um, the word daydream here, you can see it's showing me a wee picture and that picture has come from Boardmaker. Um, so again, in my school, we use Boardmaker to support learners. Um, it's a symbol uh, making tool um, and it's got loads of symbols for different words. Not every word is represented, but most words are. And you can see that it's, it's presenting them an image. So if they weren't familiar, perhaps with the, the ng sound there, they might look at that and say, I'm, I'm not really sure what I'm reading. Um, but it's a bell, so it must be ringing and it's showing me the bell's moving. And also, if I click on just one word, ringing, it will read that specific word to me. Followed. So again, if they're quite happy reading away, um, you might consider your learner quite a confident reader, but they come across a word like barrage. Barrage. 
and they can hear how it's read there. So really useful tools um, and that's all built in to Microsoft Word. It's, it's in a few other Microsoft Office apps as well, but Word is certainly the one I'd make use of it for literacy tasks. So you could use that, um, I thought in terms of tasks, um, you could be sharing a document like that, um, wherever you find that, um, perhaps you've already got some texts available. Um, you could share some text with your learners and you could ask them then to create lists of verbs or nouns you know, by word type. Um, also for an interesting one in terms of learning new vocabulary, if they do come across a word that's unfamiliar, um, they could, if I go back into it for the word um, trembling for it, um, what's it gone, it moved, envelopes, we might have a picture of an envelope but they might want to design their own board maker symbol and I think um, in terms of trembling so they might not quite associate this image so again you could have learners creating um, drawings of their own version of board maker symbols that might be um, quite useful there. The last wee tool just about the sort of vocabulary and the grammar parts here um, when I've got a document open in Word it automatically saves so you can see up here it's saving anytime I change something but we've also got this option below it to open in the desktop app and if I select that, it's going to open it up in Word, uh, which I've got installed on my machine. Well worth as well remembering, you've got two Office 365 tiles on Glow. You have this one, which lets you access Office 365 in Glow. And you also have, if we go to the app library, you have this tab here. And that is the download office and every learner can download, um, I believe is it four copies on each device, Richard, if keep me right on that one. Um, so your learners can download a multiple copies of Office 365 to use um, on their own devices at home. And that could be useful, although they would need the internet to install it. Once they've got that software downloaded to their device, whether it's a tablet, phone or laptop, um, they would be able to use that without an internet connection. So that's quite useful to have as well. And I've got this Word document that I downloaded. So it's now downloaded to my computer. And what I have here that I don't get in the online version, if I go up to review at the top, you'll see there's a lot more tools on the desktop version than there is on the, the web version. But um, the web version is a lot quicker and easier to access. Um, I've got this read aloud option again, so I can have the text read to me. And I also have my thesaurus here. So the thesaurus is not available in the online version yet. However, um, it is on the desktop version and I can select a word and Word will suggest examples. So it's, it's an old feature. You're probably familiar with using the thesaurus. But um, again, good for getting learners to think about their, their vocabulary. Um, select the word and press thesaurus. Um, or they can copy the word into the search bar here and looking for examples. Um, again, a bit like that episode of Friends where Joey gets the thesaurus. I think the first time you show your learners the thesaurus, you'll get all kinds of weird and wonderful words that maybe don't make sense in the context. So again, something to just to consider about when we are um, teaching that. World Book Day have these share stories, which I thought were, were could be really useful. Um, and they have stories um, that the authors have um, commissioned and those have all been read. So you've got a video there if you select a book. Looks like they're all aimed more at younger learners. But a couple of minutes video um, and someone could read that book to younger learners. Um, so again, you could be grabbing that web address and putting that into, um, putting that into your document and sharing that with your learners. So simply popping the web link in, you could say to learners, watch the video and then answer some questions. You could put questions here about the text. And again, very straightforward. I don't think we're, we're, we're breaking any great ground in terms of the, the activities that we're going to suggest today. But just thinking about those practical tips and guidance. How do you get those activities to your learners? Um, perhaps in school you've got you know a, a book cupboard and you've got 33 copies of each book and you can hand those out to learners to do a class novel. Perhaps you've got a huge big library in the school um, or even a limited library but learners have got the opportunity to go and get a book and perhaps at the moment um, I'm sure their, their teachers they're absolutely you know coming up with great and wonderful ideas to to get copies of books from libraries and perhaps post them or deliver them to learners but one of the bits we have with this uh, we're using digital literacy tools um, is we can find 
resources like this that are online, that are free, that are easy to access, and we can share those with our learners. Um, and as long as they've got the internet connection at home, they'll be able to, to get that and um, access a range of texts. In terms of non-fiction, quite a lot of people like BBC Bite Size. This was just the first example I found yesterday. It's about natural resources. So again, instead of handing out those non-fiction texts at school, you can be pointing them towards a website. BBC Bite Size is great because you can go in by age and stage. Um, it's Scottish specific. Um, and again, there's text there. There's a wee video for learners to watch. And again, I think the videos are, can be so much more engaging. Um, especially I think if learners are working at home at the moment, they're probably consuming video. Um, so again, you're, you're, you're sort of speaking to them in their language. But again, you could find um, traditional texts and, and share them too. Um, it gives lots of information here. We've got bold, we've got um, bullet points, we've got headings. So again, it's it's laid out. It's a good example of a non-fiction text. And again, you could just be linking to that website and then creating some questions about it. Or indeed, the website might even have some questions um, associated with it. And you could be copying and using those activities um, or adapting them. So if you point people towards the website or you could take some examples and edit those, um, add some comprehension questions of your own there and sharing that with learners. Um, so again, they're able to access um, learning similar manner they might do in the classroom, but you can deliver that remotely. The, again, if you're using something like Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams, I'm going to presume as we're on Microsoft Teams, you'll be able to go and have a wee look later at what that looks like um, and you can share files in Teams. But if you were using Google Classroom, for example, um, it's George's class with my demo, Richard, and I can share classwork. You can see here, I've got some literacy and English tasks I've already created. Um, and this one was about the Romans that we did before. So what I did was I created an assignment. And again, assignments can be really effective ways of bundling up different activities. So rather than having an email with six different attachments going out to learners, if you're using a, a management tool like Classroom or Teams, you can bundle um, a few different activities together into one activity session, a bit like, again, thinking about that primary school or perhaps early secondary, you may have two or three activities for learners to do in a lesson. Um, and again, rather than sending out lots of different activities, you could bundle them together and say, once you've completed one, move on to the other. In this example, what I did was I put in um, a question sheet here. So I just created a simple worksheet with questions. One of the examples I really like with um, the Google Docs is that you can insert, um, it's called a drawing. And what this is, is it's a drawing. I can take an image, I can add um, labels to it, and my learners are able to go in and label different parts of that. Save it, and they can hand it in. So it's, you could do this in Microsoft Word and group all the graphics together into one, but I did like the fact that make, um, the Google Docs version lets you do that with the, the insert drawing tool. Um, so that is a feature of Google Docs there. So I could have a simple worksheet, again, similar to what I might have in class. What I've done is, taking some information, again, from a BBC Bite Size, I've put it in a text document in case my learners have any issues with the online version. I've given them the link to the BBC Bite Size um, page as well. And what's great is I can give a submission date for that. I can categorise it by topic. And if I did go back to that, if I select it, I can have a look and see. So I've got Richard here in my class. I can have a look and see if he has done any of his learning yet so I could check in and see how he's getting on with his, his activities so if he's having a look at his, his worksheet and I can see that he's not made any progress with that um, I could send him a wee message there just privately asking him how's he getting on with that activity does he need any support to get moving with that so we can use those tools to, to, to hand out um, different literacy activities and um, simple things like worksheets using Word or Docs, um, as you may expect. Another one I've done, we did speak about it before, but I'd like to show you an example here.
I've created um, a few different examples um, doing the same the same sort of part. So perhaps rather than a worksheet, using a PowerPoint. And this is about the wee film I showed at the intro. Um, don't worry if you missed that. I, I'll show you where I found that. Um, and it's about a film called A Slippery Tale. And again, I'm a huge fan of using video in the classroom um, for stories and for texts. Um, it can be really useful for some learners. I found in my own experience, sometimes learners who were less confident, uh, maybe didn't have the same um, breadth of, of, of reading experience, the same wealth of reading experience there, and maybe find things like inference to be quite challenging. Whereas when they watch a video, they've got their whole life to, to draw on audio and visual cues. So I found that inference was, was a lot easier for, for most learners when they were watching a film um, or listening to a piece of music. Um, and you can use more of their senses, and that really helped them understand what inference was um, and gave them that confidence so that when they found um, inferential questions for comprehension on, on a book or a, a written piece of text, they were able to um, apply that a wee bit better. So, big fan of using video. So all I've done is created a PowerPoint, I've put some screenshots from the video in here, I've explained what I want my learners to do, I've got some images for them to look at, I want them to think, about what's happening and a wee bit of analysis. I've put a link to the video here and again you can just insert um, links and you can go to an online video if it's on YouTube and again if you put some text into PowerPoint and right click it with your mouse you can go to link and you can copy and paste the link in there as well which is what I've done. So I can give this PowerPoint out to my learners, click here, watch the video and all I'm asking them here is, how do you think the frog feels here? And I'm asking them to really look at that picture and try and understand, you know, there's, there's, there's bits, there's, there's motifs and things here about if you consider the shape of the, the leaf, for example, what does that maybe tell us? Is there something in there? Um, you can go through here and again, thinking about perspective. What does that image tell us about the two characters on the screen? And if you've done any sort of film media studies, you'll probably be quite aware of that idea that the camera is below the stalk, which is showing that the stalk's in that power of position. Again, I found my learners really enjoyed being able to analyse film like that, um, and, and that really helped them understand some of the, the ideas happening in texts. So all I've done is put a wee text box at the side, and that's where I expect my learners to make some notes, put their answers, um, and again, the last wee part here, how do we think the frog's feeling? So you can have as many slides as you wanted, but I think... What I was aiming to do there was try to present a scaffolded structure that I can give something out to my learners. I've got a visual graphic there. I've got a video as well, which has got sound. It can really draw in their senses. Um, and it's just a simple activity that you might do with a textbook, a worksheet, or, or put on your board in the class. But when you're unable to stand in front of your class, think about how do I deliver that? The beauty as well is, if I need to change this next week, I can just get different images and insert them and I could be asking similar questions. Um, and again, if I've, I've got to change or edit anything, it's it's a lot easier to do it this way than um, perhaps going through um, worksheets or, or, or Word documents. So I thought using PowerPoint um, to present some sort of structure. Um, and the last one as well is I've got a quiz that I've created. So this grid analysis has come from the Screen and Shorts website on Glow, which I'll, I'll show you next. Um, but again, I've created a quiz here. And the beauty with the quiz is that my learners um, get feedback quicker. And um, in some parts of it, I can get the quiz to mark itself, which can be really useful for you know, your busy schedule. Lots of classes, or you've got a class of 33, um, and you're, you're trying to think how to balance those and, and get feedback to learners. So. Again, I'm asking for some input here. The learners can enter their answers um, and then they go to the next section. So again, it could be do one section per day. And again, if you make a big long quiz like this, that might keep your learners going for a part of a day or across a week. What I'll show you is I'll go to the back to my Google Classroom and I'll just show you how I made that quiz. Um, so it's in forms. Microsoft Office also has forms. It works almost the exact same as the Google Forms, there's a couple of slight differences, but you probably, you'd be hard pressed to find some of them. So what I've done is I've created um, the questions here. I want my learners to enter their answer. I can make the 
question required. So particularly if you're working towards um, assessment strategies and you want your learners to have a go at every question, they can't hand in a blank answer, you can turn that option on and learners have got to um, they've got to answer the question before they can they can submit it. So really good for reinforcing have a go. Um, what I can do is if I find the right option. So if this is a quiz, what I can do is I can put an answer key in. So it's a wee bit harder to maybe use an answer key when you're asking quite open-ended questions, but you could indeed have have that. The only difficulty is their answer would have to match your suggested correct answer exactly. If the punctuation or the spaces or the spelling isn't correct, it mark it as an incorrect question. So um, that might be more useful to do with multiple choice. Um, so down towards the bottom, um, what I can do is I'm going to add in a multiple choice question. Um, so very simple, perhaps for younger learners, um, what colour was the frog? And with that answer key, I can tell the computer that green is indeed the correct answer. And if you're doing multiple choice, then um, that's really useful. That will mark itself and that might save you a wee bit of time. Um, all you will have to do is check the responses from your learners and you can go back over any, any mistakes or um, errors that they might have made there. So that was the examples we thought around comprehension um, and reading that we've got quizzes. You could make a PowerPoint um, with graphics loaded into it um, or perhaps just a simple worksheet using um, a Word um, or Docs. Um, the resource I've, I've used, I spoke about using obviously the BBC Bite Size for, for non-fiction um, non texts are free. Um, they're available through Glow. You just have to go to the Screen and Shorts icon. If you don't have it, you can add it um, and you'll find Screen and Shorts here. There's also a sister site I'll show you just now from the app library. And that is Scotland on screen. And Scotland on screen has non-fiction archive um, footage available. What's also really good about these, I'm going to talk about it quickly as a reading tool. But if you were to use it as a writing tool and you were maybe doing some media work and you wanted your learners to, to edit a video, Every film on Screen and Shorts and Scotland on Screen are copyright free and they have an option for you to download them. So perhaps you've got issues with bandwidth in your classroom, for example, or if you are presenting them to learners, you can download a copy. Um, that means you don't have to stream it. And you could also take that video that you've downloaded, put it into iMovie or another video editor, for example, and you could remove the sound and you could ask learners to create their own commentary, their own their own audio track to go with that. Um, you could chop the film up into different sections using iMovie and you could all move those around um, and then ask your learners to watch the watch the clips and try and put it in order and, and do some, some sequencing work around that if you wanted to get creative. I'm not going to show that just now because I think using iMovie would be perhaps a whole webinar um, in itself um, to, to demonstrate that. But um, I always use Slippery Tail as an example. Um, it's a favourite. I did this with a class. Um, I mentioned I had a P6 class before I, I finished at school. I had the same class um, for a while in Primary 4, and we did this story. They, they watched this film. They analysed it. They did some comprehension around it. I then asked them to take it as a piece of writing and asked them to do a recount of the story from the perspective of the frog. The writing was, was first class. Um, I absolutely... It blew me away how good the right was and I felt that they, they really were able to empathise with the frog because they had watched it and they, they really got, they, they really understood it. It wasn't dependent on their, their reading. Now again, um, you obviously want to make sure that they are able to read and get meaning from texts, but I think in terms of um, support and challenge, the film can be really useful for that. But what really got me was when I got the same class again in primary six, they asked me, can we do the story about the frog again? And I've still to this day, to get a learner to ask me, can we go back and do that Biff, Chip and Kipper book or some other reading book that we've done through school? So what I found was these 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 videos really engaged learners um, and, and they were quite keen to go back and look at these stories again that we, we don't always get perhaps with, with text in the classroom. Um, so you've got that video, you can share that with your learners. It will give you some related ones. I would always make sure that you obviously 
goes without saying, watch the film before you share it with your learners because there is one on here called The Sandman. It's recommended for primary age and, and it's terrifying if I'm honest. Um, so I wouldn't be giving The Sandman to any young learners. If you scroll down, it gives you um, a synopsis of the story here. It then gives you some pre-made activities and these are really generic questions. So again, you could be copying those, putting them into a Word document, a PowerPoint, sharing them on your team site. However you get those activities over to your learners, there's ready-made questions that you're free to take, use, adapt. Um, again, it talks you as the teacher how to walk them through. So more so if you were in front of your learners, you can freeze the screen and ask them what do you think's happening here? Why do you think the, the, the directors zoom the camera in to focus on someone's face? Um, so there's lots there about teaching um, film analysis and again it's suggesting here a simple storyboard and PowerPoint you can see where I get my idea from. Right, a character profile, so really generic stuff. I'm sure, as I said at the start, I'm not here to tell you how to teach writing or reading. I'm sure you, you, you've got your own ideas about how you do that. But what's really good is this is giving you the, the content to teach with. And again, some ideas here. An alternate ending. What happened next? I felt that to be able to rewrite a story from the perspective of the character, that was really easy for them um, because they had such a strong source material. They weren't having to imagine the whole story. Um, and, and they were able to, to use first person perspective and break parts you know, because of the camera work, really clear to see where the different parts of the story were in terms of um, paragraphs and sections of the story. So those films, free to use, um, can't recommend them enough, um, and they are in Glow, and if I can just see, where did I put Scotland on screen? Scotland on screen, same stuff, archive footage from across Scotland. One of the ones I quite like to do is take the, the documentary clips, go to look at films, Okay, it's got resources, how to tell you how to help support your teacher, um, ideas around how to do different types of analysis with film. Um, I know there is one on here called is it air. There's one about a beach. So for example, I could take this one about air fairground and it's archive footage. It'll tell me, um, it should tell me when the film is from. I'm not seeing that just now. But I can show my learners this film and I can get them to ask questions um, and answer questions about one, two, it. Three, four, five, it's really one, good for four, learners five. Yeah, thank you. to look at archive footage, particularly if you can find stuff that is relatable to them in the local context. So if you live down in the southwest, you live near air, you visited it, you might recognise some of the scenes here. Um, what I've done as a writing activity is I've asked my learners to take that footage and perhaps say their iPad or their laptop and voice over um, and they could do a narration as if it was a news report and they were telling others about this new fair at air. So really good to be able to grab those uh, pieces of content there. So the last bit part I want to do, I'll try and do this quickly and, and I'm going to hand over to Richard um, for the last part. When it comes to writing as well, I think it's, it's to understand the, the power of Office 365 um, or, or Google um, G Suite just now. If I've got a text document and I want to create a piece of writing, so one thing I suggested was perhaps using this to structure a piece of writing so you could give a PowerPoint to your learners and ask them to put content into different sections with the idea that each scene would then perhaps become a paragraph or a section of the text, a section of the story, you know, the introduction, the middle, the elbow, the end. Um, so you could use that as, as your planning tool here, making notes and talk about note making, etc. Um, very easy to stick a new slide in, he said. Um, and one of my favourite ones, again, that kind of grid idea. If I go up to insert shapes, grab a line and just even splitting, you could do it with a table, um, but just even splitting the screen up into different sections and asking learners to make notes under each part. You could do that again, insert text boxes and have a couple of text boxes on each part of the screen, pros, cons, either side. So dead easy to set those up with PowerPoint, but I don't want to spend lots of time talking about how PowerPoint works, just the ideas about how we could use it. So you could have pros, um, and cons, and you could have learners putting different ideas in different parts of the slide. 
But then when it comes to actually producing the text, if we go for a kind of traditional, I want a written document um, like Word, um, it's worth pointing out, you've got this option up here in the top right, Dictate, and we're going to test how good this works in a live demonstration. Full stop. New line. New paragraph. There we go. So I can even use um, commands such as full stop and new paragraph to um, structure my text as I go. And you can see as long as I take my time and I speak clearly to the computer, um, it's pretty accurate at capturing what I say and typing. Press the red button to stop. Now you might spot there that the, the eyes are not capitalised, so there might be a wee bit of going back in editing, but if you consider a learner who, whether it's motor skills, um, it's it's a it's a a learning support need, you know, such as dyslexia, and they find it difficult to get their words on the page, if they can talk to their computer to type, and again want to consider how you take it back to the classroom when we get back there physically. How do I get my learners to type? They might be talking um, a lot slower than perhaps you could type, but the fact that we don't now need to teach, it's a common one I think with dyslexic learners, um, that we sometimes try to support them with technology and think if I give them a computer, they can type and that takes away the need to write without maybe always having the, the consideration that now they need to learn how to type if they've not been doing that prior. So the fact that you can talk with um, you can type with your voice on this, I think it's really powerful. Um, and again, it's maybe just then going back and making some edits here. So right clicking and yeah, I want that capitalized. You could also use find and replace. Um, and again, you can find, you know, search the document for all the, the lowercase i's. Um, I space, I'll hopefully bring those up and you can replace them with a capitalized i. And you could fix that quickly that way. So again, I think it's really, is for the current situation, but also when we go back to schools, it's moving away from that old fashioned practice of writing a story or a text in a jotter and then taking it to the computer and typing it up. That's just repeating the same activity. We can do a wee bit of editing there, but if we start with the digital creator, if we start with the text document, it changes the way that we're able to write a text because again, learners hate rubbing out something that they've spent ages writing to make changes and edits to it, but the fact they can copy, paste, insert, stuff that we, we kind of standard, but also um, that we can do checks on it. If it is a report and we want to underline, you know, it's again controlling you to underline some text, we can add colour, we can add images, um, insert picture from Bing, and if I was writing about the Romans, it's always my go-to, I can grab some pictures of the Romans um, and I can pop them in. So again, learners can create real, you know, real examples of text, no a newspaper report in a jotter where they've drawn a picture of a Roman, they can actually insert this and, and edit it and manipulate it. The last wee part I want to show you here on the writing side of it is this brand new tool here up in the top right corner beside the microphone, the editor, there's a wee pencil there, and if I select that, what it's going to do is calculate a score for me. Again, I would maybe take this with a pinch of salt, I'm not going to say that the the editor makes your writing perfect. But what it's doing here is it's telling me that my spelling is all correct. It's happy with my grammar. Those are all ticked off. Um, there's no acronyms there. For clarity, it's got one here. So if I click in clarity, it's in here, it's pretty accurate. It's suggesting that a simpler word that might be easier for the reader would be correct, exact, or right. You might want your learner to, to use those to, to change that and make it more accurate but accurate might well be the right word so we can ignore that recommendation and it will tick it so when you're asking your learner to proofread their writing if we can let's get away from a jotter or a piece of a4 paper and ask them to go back through with a red pen effectively and rub stuff out and make changes if we're doing it on word this is your checklist at the end have you checked it for accuracy it's even given us you know could this be if and you can see that if I take my time, it might then not be grammatically correct, but so again, we can ignore it. Um, and again, it gives me a score down at the bottom. This document's not long enough, so what I will do is I will very quickly show you another Word document. Um, and if I run my editor over that, you can see it's going to give it a score out of 100 for how easy it is to read. 
Um, so while it calculates that, you can see I've got some spelling mistakes here. It's about 80%. And each time I fix something, um, my score is going to improve. So again, it's getting close to 100%. Down here at the stats, if I press the wee I, readability, it tells me here using the, the flesh reading ease score. I don't know how accurate that is. If anybody um, has any knowledge of that, could maybe tell us how useful that scale actually is. But it's telling us here any score above 60 um, is easy to read. It's a clear to read document. And I've got 73, so this is quite straightforward for someone to read. It would take them a minute to read it and two minutes to speak it. Um, and it's just suggesting that I've got an uncommon word here. So formative, I might want to change it to one of these. Um, but it is formative. That's the correct context there. So I can fix that. I think that's a real, I'm not saying that's the be all and end all of proofreading and checking, but I think that's a really strong tool in order to support learners um, check that the writing is clear, um, the meaning is is, is there, and that the, any spelling and grammar mistakes might be corrected. Again, it's a it's using AI, it's a computer, so there might be errors in terms of context. Um, but that's again about that's where your teaching comes in about telling your learners this tool is here. But just because the computer's telling you to make a change doesn't mean you have to change it. Um, so again, that was the, the writing. And again, I think we could go down into whole different ideas um, if we want to get even more creative um, and considering that 21st century texts um, under CFE, you, you could be creating a Word document. You could make a presentation to show the ideas, especially in terms of a report. You might use Google Sites or Microsoft Sway, which are online documents to create um, something online and interactive um, as a text rather than just having a piece of writing on a page. Um, and again, loads and loads of ideas external from Glow that you could consider. I know things like Book Creator, um, especially Book Creator 1, which is free to sign up to, and your learners can create an actual book which can be published um, and read on mobile devices. Again, I did that with my learners. We published um, our own versions of children's stories written in Scots. And for a learner to come back and say, I downloaded that book that I wrote on my granny's phone and my granny couldn't believe that I had a book published on the internet. Um, that can be really motivating. It can be really powerful for engaging a learner that. Um, and again, we might want to go to that even more creative looking at video and, and rolling in. If you're reading video, can we then go to creating video and using things like iMovie um, and clips on Apple devices. You've got a video editor on Windows devices um, and there's apps like... Um, chatter picks and sock puppets that are free, don't require any sign up and we can capture um, video images and voices in some of those um, and again it can be useful for learners using wee parts of those to create um, simple texts. So that's the main bit for me. Richard, are you good if I hand over to you for the, the bit that you've got? As so we looked at using PowerPoint, you could easily use Google Docs, uh, you could easily use Google Slides, you could use Word documents or anything um, to, to try and collate all those pieces of information and really look uh, at how you can make it easy for them. You, know, you might not always be able to answer their questions uh, and PowerPoint offers some of those features. George mentioned some of the other tools you could use uh, as well. You could use Book Creator as well. It allows you to create external links uh, as does Pages, as, uh, as does Keynote. So PowerPoint is just an example of one of the tools that you could use to kind of collate all the information. Um, so I use the context of Wars of Independence. You could use absolutely anything, and I went to Bite Size because Bite Size on BBC has uh, collated about seven or eight lessons for the Wars of Independence. They've got lots of little videos there, and they've got lots of lots of little pieces of text that the children can read. But not from a, a literacy point of view, from a digital skills point of view. I want to develop those skills, and I want them to make sure that they can do things. So each day I would have a different slide for them. And I would signpost them with really, really simple icons that I would have explained to them before, potentially in a video, potentially in a sheet, potentially in a kind of help document. And then I would begin to create little hyperlinks and also highlight things that I wanted them to do. It might be formatting plus in Keynote, but this one's for PowerPoint, so I want them to insert something using the insert tools. Um, so I would have the link to the video. And that's just a hyperlink, and they're really, really easy to create. And then that would take them to the video that's uh, embedded within the BBC Bite Size site. But again, it could be anything. It could be a video within uh, some of the ones that uh, George showed today. Um, 
and then I would have a task. So I would want them to look at something and then I would want them to do something. And that's why I've got that. I kind of thought that was an, an icon that would be useful for your kind of whiteboard, your smartboard or your blackboard. And then this is where the digital skills comes in. Because on this page, I'm asking them to take these dates and chronologically input them into the, this order, date one, date two, date three, date four, date five, date six. This was set for a kind of primary five class that I know that are capable of doing this. For a primary seven class, you might want them to insert their own table and make their own table because that's obviously a kind of a differentiated task. So that's them beginning to use their digital skills. They're going somewhere else, whether it's the sheet that you're providing within the PowerPoint, the slide, or it's the website link that you've signposted them to to get some sort of information. Again, another sheet, it's another date, it's another task. But this time I've got this read icon. I don't want them to look at something like a video. Uh, and again, I've got my little hyperlink there that will take them to somewhere externally. And this is their task. And again, I'm signposting them that I want them to insert something. And I've got this headed with today's learning task, so they know that's my instruction as a teacher, or potentially my instruction as a teacher, and then I've got the pupil task. And this is just lifted from some of the booklets that are out there for Keynote and PowerPoint, how you can make lessons a bit more interactive. This time, again, I would have had information that this is where they're going to insert a photograph. And again, they would be able to insert the photograph and put the locations in where these photographs are, and that's based on the task about them reading about um, the Wars of Independence and the three places it's mentioned in the very first video that they watched and the page that they read, and that's Norway, uh, the Western Isles and Scotland. So I would expect them, again, to use those copying and pasting tools because I want to develop their digital literacy skills. Uh, skills. Another one, again, it's the same kind of idea. I've got something I want them to look at. I've got something that they're going to follow. And then this time, uh, I was getting them to kind of use the draw tools within PowerPoint, which are up here, to draw. It's not as accurate as if you're using an Apple Pencil, but it's a little bit of fun for them to do. And again, as George said, this is about developing their digital literacy skills. And then if they wanted to, you could also get them to insert a little selfie of themselves, which they could further develop their digital literacy skills, because that might go on to use some of the filters, uh, make them black and white, make them uh, the kind of browny kind of colour, um, so you can use all them. And some more, again, got their little task and what I want them to look at and it just it's repetition 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 because I'm building on the skill day to day to day because I don't want them to feel stuck I don't want them to feel as if they don't know what they're supposed to be doing and this this kind of example has been built in the hope that it becomes normal for them the routine is normal for them so they're not asking lots of questions because as a teacher you're not there in front of them all the time and this one would be to fill in headlines so this not photographs, not putting things in a table. This time it's about creating a video for about what happened uh, to King William. And again, that's a mock news report, which is from BBC Bite Size. And if we had enough time today, we'd be able to show you them. But that's not within um, the topic, uh, within the citizenship, sorry, not the citizenship, with people in the past uh, for bite size of that is within the literacy aspect of the BBC bite size and how they're organised and I'm wanting to watch that, that one happens to be about the Titanic but I want them to watch the video and I want them to use the same skills to create the little news report for what happened to King Alexander, sorry I think I said William earlier on uh, and again I've signed posting them here making it really really simple because this is all about them developing their digital literacy skills so just really really simple things that I wanted them to do uh, to fill in to create some sort of work and then they'll be able to give it back to me in whatever form that they're using it whether it's docs or slides within Google Classroom or it's Teams and PowerPoint and Word within uh, Microsoft the other thing I can do is I can come up to record and I can begin to record the slide and I'm not going to do that because we don't have enough time it's really really easy to do this is a Mac that I'm using it's easy to do on a, a Windows based system as well a little example of how you can bring all that type of learning together and create maybe a week's worth or a fortnight's worth of work that you think your learners can engage in. I think that's us just about finished, George. Yeah, and I think the, the, the what I thought was really great when Richard shared that with me the, the other day is the fact that once you've made that, and as Richard says, the repetition, repetition, getting your learners familiar with the, the types of tasks and how you'd like them completed, if you've made that for, you know, their Scottish Wars Independence, you're just going back and editing it um, and changing parts um, 
to, to reuse it week after week if that's what you need to do. Um, and again, it's about that, you know, being, being kind to yourself um, and, and making your workload easy um, or as easy as possible. And um, again, making it familiar for your, for your learners that they're seeing the same types of, it might be different questions, different types of um, questions or texts, but the structure's there. And, and again, in times like this, I think to have that sense of familiarity with your learners um, could be really, really powerful. So I think that is just about us in terms of the content. What I'm, I'm hoping is that we've hopefully stirred some imagination and people are thinking, you know, I've got these great ideas that I, would, I was doing in the classroom and I, I, I wasn't maybe sure how I, how I do it now digitally. Um, I think a lot of people have been looking for being able to present live to learners and I think what we've got there are some examples where you don't have to present live um, but if you create the right sort of um, resource um, it can instruct and scaffold the learning for your learners um, without you having to be there speaking to them live and then as Richard showed at the end there we can use PowerPoint and record um, a lesson if that is what your learners need um, so there's no really um, a need to be zooming and skyping learners on every activity that there are there are ways to do that without uh, live video so that's what we were really aiming at as i say I, I don't think we've really talked about any new or unique or clever ways to to teach writing um we'll leave that to um, our colleagues in the literacy and english team but what we what we hoped we can do is show you how to use your digital literacy skills and indeed as richard says the the, the young people's digital literacy skills to use the tools that are at their fingertips to make the learning a wee bit more engaging um, and hopefully progressive where they're building on what they've, they've done before. Um, but thank you for joining us.